the purpose of the creation, the purpose of the beauty of the creation is as a sign to bring us closer to Allah. It's as a sign of Allah's greatness, of Allah's beauty. But sometimes what we do is we lose ourselves in the beauty itself and we forget that it's intended only as a sign. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created so much beauty in dunya and that beauty is actually intended for a purpose. But if we lose ourselves in that creation, we actually miss the whole purpose. What we have to be careful of is not losing sight of the destination and the goal because of that beauty. In other words, what is intended to be a sign can become a distraction if you lose sight of the goal. If you were to ask me when was the next time I had a huge change in my life, was probably when I met my husband, No. Um, you know, alhamdulillah, he's, he's a great guy, you know, he, he's pious, he's a good guy, he's my young, he does everything and he advised me as well. So having that kind of influence in my life really helped me change as well. So no, having his influence and then alhamdulillah, going for Umrah as well and, and then um, and you know, I guess even the whole thought of wearing the hijab, it was something which he had suggested earlier on, which I didn't really understand yet. <laughs> um, but later on, after learning, I at first I was like, no, no, you know, I'm not ready yet. You know, I have an album to, to launch, you know. I'm going to the States, I'm going to America, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think um, I knew in my heart that one day I was going to wear it. I just didn't know when. Uh, and how, and how to do it. I, I knew that in my heart I wanted to do something that would help the world, will help people, something. But I just didn't know how. So, you know, one thing led to another, and alhamdulillah, we went for Hajj, and that was another big event in my life. And from that event, it has led to um, my change now. And inshallah, in the future, there'll be more changes to, towards becoming a better Muslim. So that's, that's really why I'm here. Like any other wife, I make it a priority to fill my marriage with abundance of love and happiness. This is one topic I can't wait to discuss with Yasmin. I've been married myself for about two, three years. Um, but I do find some struggles at times. Um, so what would be your advice to, to help couples keep a marriage strong, keep it fresh, and, and what makes a marriage last? Oh, wow. <laughs> Big question. Yeah, Big yeah. question. Alhamdulillah. Um, first of all, I would say there is um, what you can do before marriage. Um, and then what you do in marriage. Um, now for before marriage, I think one of the most important things you can do to make a marriage strong is actually has to do with expectations. Uh, that when you enter the marriage, you should not be entering the marriage empty and being expect and expecting to be filled. From the very beginning, um, your expectations need to be in the right place. That this is not a person who I am um, getting married to so that they can fix me, so that they can save me, so that they can make me happy, so that they can fill me, but that instead your, your, your fill and your fulfillment and your self-worth uh, comes from your relationship with Allah. And so this is a whole different way to enter into marriage uh, when you're already full. And now when a person is already full, they're in a much better position to give. And then the relationship can be more generous. From the Islamic paradigm, we know that, 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 this, that this emptiness, that it can only be filled by Allah, and the happiness, and the, that the, the, only, uh, the only one who can save me is Allah. And, and the reason why this can become very confusing is because we have like many fairy tales, right? Yes. And the fairy tales always <laughs> teach you that 
that you're going to be saved by a prince, mm -hmm. right? You're going to be prince saved, Charming. Prince Charming, right? He's going to save you and, and, and everything is going to be perfect after that. And so we, we actually internalize these myths about marriage and about romantic love, right. it, it being that it's it's what turns dunya into jannah, you know? Because life isn't perfect. <laughs> exactly. Not perfect. So realizing that is very important, um, your expectations. And then within marriage, I think one of the most important ingredients which I think is very lost, um, is, is actually the concept of respect. Um, I think that we as women, we, we sometimes have a little bit of trouble with the notion of um, what is called unconditional respect. Unconditional respect? Unconditional, yeah, exactly. It means no You're, matter what? Yeah, see, 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 <laughs> see, it's, it's kind of like, what? No, I don't know. But see, okay. what's very interesting, there's this book, um, and, and in the book, it's a relationship book about the, the dynamic of love and respect. And his essential thesis is that a woman's primary need, um, and of course there are exceptions, but in general, these are trends, that a woman's primary need is to feel loved. And a man's primary need is to feel respected. Okay. Now, when either a man or a woman does not get their primary need, they don't give the other person's primary need. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> how that works is, when a man feels disrespected, mm -hmm. he will act unloving. And when a woman feels unloved, she acts disrespectful. Okay. And that yeah. creates... <laughs> yes. That creates what this author refers to as the crazy cycle. It's a cycle that is so that perpetuates itself and is very hard to break out of. And a lot of marriages break because of this cycle. It is a cycle that as a woman, I feel that he's being unloving or I feel like he doesn't care or whatever. Yeah? And as a result, I react with disrespect. And when he feels disrespected, it only makes him more unloving. So it's just like fire playing with yes, fire when that yes. happens. It, it just perpetuates. So so how do so you, how do you break out? Yes, right? how do you break out the fire? And how you break out of it is with two things. Unconditional love and unconditional respect. Now as women, we understand easily the concept of unconditional love, don't we? So we, 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 we in fact that's the way we love. Yes. But we have a lot of trouble with unconditional respect. We think, well, you know, no, you got to deserve, you got to earn my respect. And if you act in this way, I won't respect you. And if you act in that way, I won't respect you. Right. And that and that's a problem. Mm. Because what really needs to happen is it needs to be unconditional, that the respect is always there. And whenever that happens, you will find that that the man will be more loving to him. Mm -hmm. That the, the best way to make a man be kind and loving is to make him feel respected. Now we're moving on to the next phase of marriage where you, you start to have children. And I have a lot of girlfriends. My best friend has two kids. Um, inshallah, I will have children in the future. Inshallah. Inshallah. Ameen, ameen. <laughs> ameen. Ameen. Um, and she's got two kids between the ages of two and seven. And she asked, um, what is the best way to teach your child about Allah? How do you introduce the concept of Allah to, to a baby or to a child? And how do you, how do you make them love Allah from a young right. age? Right. Yeah. I'll answer that question by giving you an example. Okay. Um, if, if you have, if the child has an aunt that they've never met, and every single day that aunt sends a gift, right? And then puts the gift, and, and the gift comes and it's at the doorstep. Okay. And every day you tell your child, this gift is from Aunt Sara. And the next day, Aunt it's Sarah, okay. Aunt Sara. So this, okay. is a, this is an aunt named okay. Sara, mm -hmm. and that this is an aunt that they've never met and they've never seen. Mm -hmm. But every day they get a gift, something they love. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a treat or it's a toy or it's a game. Mm -hmm. And every single day you say to them, this is from your Aunt Sara. This is from your Aunt Sara. What's going to happen as the years go by? Even if they never met Aunt Sara, they will love Aunt Sara. Yeah, right? they, well, Aunt Sara gives everything. Gives everything. Yes. <laughs> and in the same way, we have to teach them about Allah. Mm -hmm. Okay? We, one of the ways to teach them to love Allah is to link the, all the things they have back to Allah. Okay. So for example, they have a, you know, they have the, the food that they want. They have a warm place to sleep where other people don't. 
they 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 have this toy they have this game where did the money come from to get those things right a little kid can understand these things right. so you tell them oh you're getting well why because a lot exactly all exactly all I exactly. gave us this money so we can live yes. in this house yes so we can sleep in this really nice bed exactly and okay. always mention Allah mm -hmm. Allah should be part of the conversation we should not think that Allah is something they can't understand they can understand at their level do not keep Allah out of the conversation when you're outside and you see this the Sun they obviously see the Sun they see the stars they see the moon the, the clouds who made this Allah yes. you know bring it always back to Allah teach them to say things like subhanallah mm -hmm. and alhamdulillah thank you Allah thank you. Um, being grateful for the things they have mm -hmm. you know kids they get hurt all the time right yeah. Yeah. and when they fall and they have a cut and then the next day it's healed who did that Allah yeah. did that Allah he's did a that. Shafi yes. and this is how you teach about his attributes that he is the one who heals you right mm -hmm. he is a razak he's the one who gives you the money to buy your toys mm -hmm. to buy your you know everything that you have and another thing that that's very important is to talk about Jannah okay uh -huh. oh, because, oh, oh yes, from a young age as yes, well okay. yes to talk about Jannah and to create a a, a, a desire for Jannah if there is like this place suppose it's like a, an amusement park okay Disneyland and the child has never been there and, and, and never seen it but every day you tell them about Disneyland okay. right you say you know in Disneyland <laughs> you can eat all the candy you want yeah. in Disneyland you can ride all the rides you want mm -hmm. in Disneyland you can have all the truck and you talk about this you know what they're gonna want to go to Disneyland yeah, correct I'm sure they will correct? Yes. yeah but this is how we should talk about Jannah we should teach them about Jannah when they want something and they can't have it inshallah in Jannah inshallah in Jannah oh, yeah, that's a good yeah? you know it's like inshallah in Jannah you do whatever you want so I my point is that sometimes there's things that they're gonna want they can't have um, and we have to teach them that this world is imperfect yes. but but there's a world that's perfect yes. and 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 you teach it at their level obviously in the things they care about and the things they love so Shala. then they're that's amazing <laughs> yeah, my, my, my hair stood up right then yeah, subhanallah, <laughs> because it's true it's yeah. absolutely true yeah um, and and it makes them you know make them have a desire for that for that perfect world because this world is they're not gonna get everything they want yeah. so put that that love in their heart I think yeah. that those are those, those are two very important things the attachment and love to Allah uh, for Allah and the and the desire and attachment for Jannah so the idea here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put so many things in dunya of the creation that are signs. And what I want to do in, in this time right now is reflect on one ayah from Surah Al-Hadid. And this ayah, actually this is the perfect place to reflect on this ayah. Because this is an ayah in which Allah gives us an analogy of dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'lamu. So the beginning of the ayah is that Allah is telling us, no. I'lamu means no. I'lamu. Annama al-hayatu dunya la'ib. The first word is play. Allah says, no, that the life of this world is play. You see, we go through different phases in life, correct? And in every phase in life, there's like something that's most important to us in that phase of life. This has to do with, for example, our attachments. We talked about the other day, talking about what's most important to you, right? Looking in, into the heart and seeing. So, but, but it doesn't stay the same, does it? It changes with, with, uh, as we develop. So as we are in each stage of life, there's something of dunya that is most important to us. When you're in your first stage of life, what, what are you? You're a baby, right? What's most important to a baby? Playing, right? Play. So if you want to make a baby happy, you get him a rattle, you get him a toy. That would make the baby's world, right? If you go and you get that baby, a Tommy Hilfiger suit, and you know how they dress up babies in these like cute local, the baby couldn't care less, right? Baby doesn't care, you do it for the parents. You do it for the people. But the baby, you give him a toy, you give him or her a toy, you play peekaboo, and the baby is just thrilled. That's dunya for, for the child, right? My dunya is play, and this, this is the first stage of life. Everything is about play. The next stage, Allah says, amusement and, and or entertainment. This, this idea of entertainment is most important. It's not just about playing, it's just about being entertained. And so in this stage of life, dunya is lahu. 
That's the most important thing to someone in that stage of life. And then we move on and we get older, don't we? And now the ayah says, after la'ibun wa lahun wa zina. Zina is adornment. It's looking nice. And you know, of all the stages of life, in which stage do you care most about what you look like and what you're wearing? And this is the stage where like never before and never again do you take that long to get ready in the morning, right? <laughs> right? You look you look at the amount of time you get ready that you take to get ready and it's like it, it changes, right? And then it kind of peaks right around that that sort of high school age, right? What you look like is so important at that stage because because the idea of body image is so important. How you look is so important. What you wear is so important. So how you appear, your 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 adornment, your your zina. Zina becomes the most important thing. Now we move on. Now we move on. Laibun wa lahun wa zinatun wa tafakhurun baynakum. Now you notice then we get older, don't we? And when you think about the time now we're in college and post college. See, at that point we're not interested in rattles anymore. We're not so interested in in the um, entertainment and you know entertain me and the lahu anymore. Although those things may be, you know, something you do. Yeah, you play video games, but it's not the most important thing anymore. But there's something else that becomes very important at that at that stage. Tafakhrum baynakum. This is the stage where you're trying to prove yourself. Tafakhrum baynakum means um, boasting between one another. You know this stage where it's like, oh, where did you get accepted into college? And you know, that competition and, and boasting. And you have to do this when you're um, trying to get into colleges, right? It's all self-promotion, isn't it? You have to write like an essay about how you're the best person in the hum whole human race. And then you, when you apply for a program, you, it's all about self-promotion, isn't it? Tafakhrum baynakum basically summarizes that stage, doesn't it? Now once that stage is over, and then people get married and they settle down, and now they have kids. Now at this stage, this is the last stage that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning. This is, you know, the, the competition now in, in how, who has the, um, the nicer house, right? And who and the, then how we decorate our house, and then what kind of car we drive, and then our children, right? So now we use our children to show off. Um, you know what? What my kid is, uh, you know, what degree my kid has, what school my kid is in, um, what career, what he's doing, what she's doing, how much you know we spent on our weddings, and all of this kind of stuff. That becomes our our focal point, right? And then after all of that, you know what he says? It's like a heavy rain that pleases the farmer. If there's a farmer who has a garden and it starts to rain, the farmer's going to get very excited. Why? Because the rain is now going to obviously bring about vegetation. Allah is saying that all of these things, all of these stages and all of these things that we we just, you know, consume ourselves with and we revolve our lives around all of that together is like that rain that makes the farmer happy for a moment, right? But then what happens to that vegetation? That vegetation then starts to dry up and crumble until you find it becoming yellow. You know, if you take a leaf like this, right? Eventually it's, it's pretty dry right now. Eventually, it's going to become even drier, so much that I can just crumble it up, and then it's just debris. That's the nature of dunya. And then the ayah goes into what happens after that, and what actually matters. وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانٌ So then, after all of that, the only thing that is that remains is two options. Two options in the hereafter either punishment from Allah, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for protection, or forgiveness from Allah and His pleasure. 
وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور. And then after all of this, Allah asks, Allah says, what is the the life of this world but chattel of deception? متاع الغرور. That these things that we we run after, right? And these things that we that become our entire world are actually just deception because they're not really real and they all pass away. And so this is this is to teach us how to redirect our ultimate focus. That the ultimate focus should be what happens at the end of this ayah, which is one of two options, either severe punishment or forgiveness and pleasure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to make us among those who can stay focused, um, to keep our hearts focused. And, and this process of, of focusing the heart isn't something we do once. It's a constant, lifelong process. It's a lifelong struggle of reorientation, of refocusing the heart on that destination. I think Allah called out to me many times, many, many times, even before that. But I just, I just chose not to, uh, not to see it, you know? Times in which maybe I could have died in, in a near, near accident or something else, you know? When He takes away something that you love so much, something else replaces it. And we get closer to Him, alhamdulillah. And so, you know, I, I would really, really wish that, you know, for everyone to, to you know, that they can also be there in Jannah. And we can also strive for the same thing. And uh, for, you know, I, that's probably why I'm here as well. Like, I, I want to do and learn as much as I can so that I can have my castle in Jannah. You know, that's like the biggest thing. A week in New Zealand with Yasmin has been a life-changing experience. Never in a million years would I have imagined myself being here, learning from the best teachers surrounded by majestic views of this place. Throughout all of this, I found me. There is nothing that I need to do or to prove to myself and others. Being a slave really sets me free.